Good afternoon and welcome to Marketing Live for Thursday, March 31st, 2016. I'm your host, Rob Zenkin. I serve as Associate Vice President for Marketing at Indiana University, and I'm especially excited about today's topic and guest as we discuss the brand flip for higher ed. Marketing Live is part of the Higher Ed Live Network, offering viewers direct access to the best and brightest minds in education and beyond. Live broadcasts allow viewers to share knowledge and participate in discussions around the most important issues in our sector. All episodes of Marketing Live are free and accessible in the video archives at higheredlive.com and in podcast format on iTunes. Today's live viewing experience is powered by Maestro, the premier marketing tech platform for broadcasters. Higher Ed Live is produced by M. Stoner, a marketing and communications firm that works with education institutions on branding, strategy, web design, and more. Are you preparing for a website redesign project? Knowing that your website needs an overhaul isn't usually the problem. Getting started is. Download M. Stoner's helpful seven-step checklist to get you started on the right path for a successful website redesign. Thanks, as always, to M. Stoner. Well, all right, let's meet today's special guest, Marty Neumeyer. Marty is Director of Transformation at Liquid Agency, where he helps some of the world's most amazing companies become even more amazing. He is a best-selling author. He lectures all over the world about the role of creativity and innovation in the creation of relevant and meaningful brand experiences. Our viewers are likely familiar with his books, The Brand Gap and Zag. Zag was one of the 100 best business books of all time, named to that list. And his latest book, The Brand Flip, which we'll discuss today, about the rising power of customers. Marty, good afternoon or good morning in your case. Delighted to have you join today. Thanks, Rob. It's great to be here. Well, this is going to be a terrific discussion. And before we jump into The Brand Flip, I'd like to give viewers a chance to get to know you a little bit better. So I'll ask if you could share something about your professional journey, Marty, something about your own story that has had a lasting impact on you over the years in your career. Well, thinking back, um, I think it was a big turning point for me. I was a graphic designer and a budding copywriter way back when. Uh, and I read a book uh, called The Third Wave. I don't know if anybody has read that or remembers it, but it came out about 1980 or something like that, 84 maybe. Uh, um, and it was about the, the, future, um, the future of the world uh, after the advent of the computer chip, really. So it's about how uh, the third wave is, is the, you know, the agrarian age, the industrial age, and then the third wave is the information age. So the information age, basically. Um, and it just um, opened my brain up, you know, and I just started thinking, this sounds quite plausible, and I can see a big shift coming on, and I've got to be wherever this is happening. And when I looked into it, it was Silicon Valley. I never even heard of it before so, in the early 80s. And, uh, and I discovered Apple Computer, and I kind of got excited about that. And I decided after a few years of soul searching, I had to leave my comfortable existence and move to Silicon Valley. So a book made me, made me do it. <laughs> Alvin Toffler, brilliant uh, futurist. So I moved up there and got working with Apple and with some other companies and, and just made my home up there for 25 years, brought my family and everything. And it was a huge turning point. And so just about everything that I write about is comes from that experience of, of being in that community where you're always trying new things and you don't accept uh, anything, any traditional way of doing anything, um, which is great. It was a great experience. Still is. Well, you mentioned a shift, and, and certainly that's at the core of the brand flip and a shift in branding and giving the, the power again to the, to the customers that the, the brand is about them. And I'm, I'm interested to hear your perspective on the evolution of branding and, and how that's been reflected over the course of your books, Gap, uh, the brand gap, Zag, and the brand flip in yeah. that, that evolution of branding that you've seen for companies. Well, you know, branding, um, it's still misunderstood because um, we use the same word to mean something different now. So the, the you know, branding used to be um, something that companies did. 
So you you named your product, you created a logo, you you know you built you built the product, you uh, put it on a national ad campaign, and if you had the clout to do all that, you'd succeed. It was just you know all things being equal, you do okay with that, right? And that was branding. So the whole industry of branding, uh, which was considered part of marketing, uh, was just about identity, right? Creating identities for products and doing a, a good job of that. And if you did a good job, you'd be successful. Um, branding is quite different now. It's, um, so that's where the confusion arises. People that say, well, I, I hate branding. They're really thinking of branding as advertising. And people don't like advertising. Uh, you don't like advertising, I'm sure. It's like it's really annoying. You need it sometimes, but often it feels pushy. Uh, it feels like it's um, hiding something, so forth. And so people think, well, that's branding. You're, 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 you're painting something a different color than it really is. But that's not what it is anymore. So what's happened uh, since probably 1985, 86, 1990, is that it's shifted where uh, a brand is no longer uh, a logo <clears throat> or an ad campaign or a product. A brand is the customer's uh, understanding of that uh, product, service, company, organization. So the brand is sort of the reputation of this organization. So um, where do brands get created? Well, they get created in people's heads, right? They're, Customers and, and users, they're the ones that are creating the brands. They form your reputation. You just give them the raw materials to do that. So what you give them is really important. But as long as we keep thinking of branding as something that we do as organizations, we're always going to be failing because um, everyone else is going to say, no, 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 that's not what you are. I know what you are, and it's not that. <laughs> and as soon as you have that doubt creep in, you've got a lack of trust, and trust is the whole basis of, of a brand, of a successful brand. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, in other words, a brand isn't what you say it is. It's what they say it is. That's the whole idea. It's their yeah. gut feeling. And today, what they say matters more than it ever, ever has before. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Well, that aligns perfectly. And one of my favorite parts from the, the brand flip, as we talk specifically about that, and I'll read this section because it, it did, it resonated with me. And I think it's to the essence of the book, again, with what you just outlined that, Customer identity, not company identity, is the secret to a flipped brand. Shouldn't we be just designing a framework in which our customers can see themselves, build their unique identities, and ultimately become who they are? So that is so fitting for the, the higher education industry. So can we dive into that even a little bit more, more deeply because we yeah. talk about empowering the customers? Yeah, it's about empowering the customers. Um, it used to be about um, just creating satisfaction, right? You know, you, you say you're going to do something and you try to get as close as you can to that promise and then people are satisfied if it comes anywhere close. But they always think it never quite matches up and that's the, 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 uh, the problem with advertising. It promises more than it can deliver, right? So you're always disappointing your, your customers. But yeah, so we, what we want to do is st stop thinking about the company identity and who we are and like how we present ourselves as much as we should be thinking about what do we want our customers, in this case, our students to become? What do we want for them? I mean, what do we hope for them? Um, what's the, the, the highest good we can offer them? And what, so really what we're talking about is uh, not a superficial um, messaging system here. We're talking about uh, a product that actually does something important for people in the long term. Then we talk. Then we tell them what that is, right? So um, it's more about creating a better product today than just creating a an advertising campaign or a messaging campaign. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, um, really, if we're if our job is creating customers, in this case, creating students and and successful students, um, shouldn't we be designing them? I mean, not in some sort of Frankenstein or Big Brother way, but I mean, shouldn't we design a space that they can see themselves in and then inhabit? Like we create the shape of this this uh, experience, this the future them, and they walk into it and 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 become it. I mean, that's that's how you get um, 
that's how you get famous, which is sort of the essence of branding is getting famous. And you have people love you forever, right? And, and that's really, uh, brands are all about the long term. They're not about short term sales. Mm -hmm. And you even tweeted just this week about uh, the disruptive flip of any industry isn't a question of whether, but when. And oh, yeah. the choice, flip or be flip. So uh, what a great statement that's certainly applicable to, to the higher education industry. It and, is, and, yeah. And I think right now education is overdue for a flip. It's overdue to be disrupted, and I think it's getting disrupted around the edges. But usually disruption takes a while to happen, and you see it happen, and you go, well, that's not really a threat to us. And then suddenly it's a threat. And it's overnight, you're, you're, you're made obsolete. So real leadership is about seeing that coming, right? I mean, seeing that, that possibility and, and um, being proactive. And I wonder um, how some of these very entrenched uh, institutions are going to do in this situation because they've never had this before. They've never had to protect themselves against completely having the rug pulled out from under them. And, that, and I think that's what's happening in every industry. And it hasn't really happened in education. That means it will, you know. <laughs> it's just it matter. will. And you have, you have to get in front of the parade. Yeah, but either that or you you join the, the, uh, the other side and you become one of the ones who disrupt. But... Uh, we, we hate to see huge organizations being made obsolete, right? I mean, it's much better to, to uh, get ahead of the parade and lead it. Well, one of our previous guests on the broadcast, Jason Simon, wrote a blog post in December that was motivated by the brand flip that essentially higher ed marketing uh, focuses on prospective students for enrollment purposes. It focuses on alumni and donors for fundraising purposes but it overlooks current students, what you were just talking about, the ones who are experiencing the brand on a daily basis, the ones who are shaping the brand. And we'll tweet out a link to that post for those who haven't seen it. But he said that our, as our current students grab the marketing funnel and make it a megaphone to their actual experiences on campus, it's time that more of our brand experiences better support their voices, their needs, and their concerns. So as you hear that perspective, what, what thoughts do you have, something that was sparked by the brand flip? Well, I love the image of grabbing the funnel and turning it into a micro microphone. Uh, that, um, yeah, I mean, if you don't pay attention to the students who are, are your customers while they're students, where are the donors going to come from in the future? It's very short term, right? It's like it, it's, it's, uh, it shows a bit of desperation, I think. It's like we got to get uh, more enrollments now, and we have to get more money now, and we're just going to sacrifice those people who are actually experiencing this education. Um, and th that typically is not a good sign for any organization, right? I mean, just to be honest, um, it means you're, 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 you're desperately trying to stay alive instead of investing. You're not in a, a powerful position of investing in the future. So somehow um, organizations have to get out of that loop. They really have to figure out um, – how they're going to get ahead of it. And I, I do know this, that it's not going to be by doing the same thing over and over again. It's going to have to be something different. What that is, of course, is the scary part. How do we find it? How do we um, take a risk? How, how do we avoid risk while we, while we innovate and so forth? But um, yeah, following the leader is not going to get you there. And so the only way to, to, uh, to get out of this or get around this eventual flip is to innovate. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting that as higher ed marketers, on, on one hand, we're in a great position in that we work at these exciting multi-dimensional places and certainly higher education has a transformative impact on the lives of students and our constituents have this lifelong association with the brand. On the other hand, branding is newer to higher education, we have an array of inherent challenges ranging from our decentralized organizational structures, a myriad of constituent groups to serve, and in some cases, the fact that branding is not necessarily widely accepted or, or understood by some of our internal colleagues. So I'm curious what some core pieces of advice might be that you would offer to viewers who are working to build a compelling a differentiating an enduring higher ed brand at their schools? Well, I can see how 
um, the word brand wouldn't sit well in this sort of mm -hmm. institution, and maybe you shouldn't use it. Maybe maybe branding just sounds like a um, a commercial word. Um, but you could e easily substitute something like positioning, you know, or reputation in some cases. But I think reputation is like, well, we have a good reputation, don't we? I mean, everyone says we do. Uh, reputation in this sense, a competitive rep. Uh, reputation means that you're different in some way. So to use your word, differentiation really matters. Um, and I think that's the hardest thing, uh, as you kind of indicated, with uh, a broad organization, is there's so many parts to it, so many factions. Uh, it's so democratic in a way that you can't just lead it from the top. And so therefore, it's difficult to, to have what I call onlyness. Onlyness is you you you've, you uh, you you fill in the blanks. Our school is the only blank that blanks, right? So the first one would be university, <laughs> the only university that what? There has to be some very short answer in there that makes you the only of all the choices students have, so that it makes it easy for them to choose you, right? That's how it. Uh, that's how it works. And if if you can't figure that out, then you're battling against everybody. Then then it's just flip a coin, right? And that's so that's not branding or positioning at all. You really have to find out uh, how you're different. So I mean, I work with various institutions to do this. Some of them are easier. Like I work with Art Center College. Um, there are a lot of art schools, but not that many, and they do have a different flavor. So they are able to find that and exaggerate that, right? And and make make the institution more what it is. Um, the University of California that I worked with, um, their system is a little more difficult because they have 10 campuses. But we spent a lot of time work thinking about this and talking about it. And we realized that, well, 10 campuses is kind of interesting, 10 in the same state. And they all have various uh, flavors and they have various specialties, but they weren't drawing out those specialties very much. They weren't exaggerating them and, and uh, sacrificing some of the things that they shouldn't be. So what, the re what we realized was each campus should be doing something different in some way or providing a different atmosphere or different feeling. And then they have to be very clear about those feelings. And then they have to hire to those, to those, dif th those un unique uh, attributes, right? So it's a long-term plan for making each of their campuses more special. So they all fit together and cover the, cover the waterfront. So kind of like the way General Motors figured out that we need a, a different car for each stratum of, uh, of uh, wealth in the country. So you start with a Chevrolet and you move up to an Oldsmobile and then a Buick and then, and then finally a Cadillac, but they had it all figured out. And they did really well with that system until it broke down and everyone was competing with everybody. Soon mm -hmm. like a Cadillac, I mean, a, a, a Chevrolet and a Buick was the same thing, just slightly different. And so the whole thing's in disarray now. But, um, you know, that was their issue. But every organization would have a different onlyness. And, and if you can't figure that out, or it's so hard for anyone to see, then all the messaging in the world isn't going to save you. You've got to change who you are, right? So, and who you are should really match um, uh, what your customers, your, your students, are trying to become. Those two should sit really well together. So your purpose and their, um, their identity should match. They, they should be natural, naturally fitting together. Well, following up on that, uh, the, the concept of onlyness is certainly an intriguing one in higher education in a, a marketplace with 3,000 plus four-year institutions in the United States. If I look at my university, for example, and its competitive set, these institutions certainly look more alike than they do different. So yeah. and you've talked about your experience working with even multi, multi-campus universities, and it is a challenge in higher ed to align and to identify what is what is that that point of onlyness, that point of core differentiation. So in your experiences, what have been some of the, the biggest barriers that keep organizations from achieving that onlyness? Is it the is it the courage of leadership or institutional will, something else, or as you said, just a matter of there may not be something and they need to change who they are. 
I think usually large organizations, whether they're companies or schools or whatever they are, don't change easily. Uh, they resist change. They snap back. Um, you know, if you, it's like a, a ball of rubber rubber bands. If you pull on one, it just tightens it on the other side, and then it snaps back. When you, they they just don't want to change. So they they usually change. Um, in situations where they're desperate or they're being disrupted or they uh, there's creeping irrelevance where they just realize they're gonna it's existential they're just gonna go out they're just gonna be irrelevant unless they do something so where the leadership comes in is seeing envisioning that desperation and disruption and creeping irrelevance before it happens so if you got somebody who can do that and can tell that story convincingly over and over and over again to a large number of people, you can get the whole organization to change. I mean, IBM changed. They had a great leader who kept telling them the story over and over, like, you aren't, we aren't going to sell giant computers anymore. We're going to sell services. So take off those blue suits, just wear normal clothes, and you're going to be, you're going to be a different person, right, from now on. And, and we're hiring different kinds of people now. So they were able to do that. And I think it's not easy, but... Um, but you can't live in denial. You know, you have to see, like you can just see what's happening to, you know, to, to uh, education. It's really in trouble. It costs too much. People aren't getting what they need. It's what they're learning isn't what is where the jobs are necessarily. I mean, it's not all bad, but it's just generally there's that feeling to it that you've seen in just about every industry that s starts to become irrelevant and then gets disrupted, right? And you can see the disruption all around in education little on the fringes, little experiments and everything. Um, and uh, most of them cost less money. So um, if people, if students cannot afford an education, but they can afford a computer, they can educate themselves, right? And pretty soon they're going to say, well, why do we need the, uh, the schools again? You know, <laughs> that's what usually happens. But it, I know that sounds absurd to you right now, but I think, uh, when these things happen, they happen all at once, and then suddenly you say, oh, "Why didn't we see it coming?" You know. So I'm, I just think um, there's so much good in all these organizations, but it would be great to to start some little experiments on the side to try to disrupt itself, to try to disrupt yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. Little self-contained things that if they fail, you just, so what? You start something else, and then. When they start to work, you then you then you um, bring them into the main organization, and you start changing. You start building the organization, or changing it around this idea that's working. Just a quick reminder to our viewers: if you have a question or comment or want to jump in, please feel free. Uh, tweet using the Higher Ed Live hashtag. And Marty, you just mentioned uh, a lot of good in our colleges and universities, and and that's what being a comprehensive university is, all the different elements to these yes. multi, multi-pronged missions. And it makes me think of a colleague at a peer institution who said that his university does everything from canoe rentals to discovering planets outside of our solar system and everything in between. <laughs> yeah. The and, canoe rentals probably make more money. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, that's it. It's, it's so diverse. And how do you, how do you, uh, create any differentiation out of that. Everyone's trying to do everything. Well, on the brand flip, one of your um, key tenets is simplicity. And and I'd like to, to hone in on that because certainly there are several obstacles to achieving simplicity in higher education. And so I'd like to hear, and you outlined some of these in the book, but what are some of those enemies to simplicity for organizations and how do you go about overcoming them? Well, we're, we humans are so good at adding stuff. We're really good at adding new things and features and inventing new things, but we're not very good at subtracting. Subtracting is the discipline of branding. It's getting rid of stuff that doesn't support your onlyness, right? So it's always pruning back. I mean, uh, where that level is between simplicity and complication, you have to figure that out for yourself. But I, I, I think it's safe to say that you always need to be pruning things that aren't working, that aren't contributing to your difference, that other people do better. If you find that you're always in competition with another organization, then you need to differentiate. Somebody does because you're just, 
you're basically dividing the the profits. You're you're um, you're lower. You're you're competing away the profits. You're competing away the students. Um, they're going other places because you uh, are not clearly different. And and um, I think even a big organization can be clearly different. I mean, there's plenty plenty of examples of those. But the tendency is just to copy everybody, whatever whatever else is working. You know, just be opportunistic and oh, that's working over there. Let's we can do that. We can do that. Let's take this. We'll take that. And then pretty soon you're trying to be everything to everybody, and uh, you can't compete because you look like everybody. And the students going, I don't know. I, I just to flip a coin. I don't know. I like. I want to. You know. I want to live in Chicago, so I'm going there. Just like the, the superficial reasons for for. Ta um, choosing one school over another because the schools are not differentiated. Mm -hmm. And I think it's in Zag where you, where you talk about that uh, best practices are generally or are typically common practices. Yeah. Um, and that's so, again, applicable to, to, to higher education and, and um, gets back to your point about disrupting and, and where are those points that we can innovate even if it's on the edges. Um, also with, with simplicity, you address that from the, the standpoint of our various touch points. And, and, and we have a multitude of touch points in higher education, but also in making sure that uh, we have the most telling touch points, but that they are as few as possible. And so could you elaborate on that a little bit uh, in, in minimizing those, those key touch points when we, again, have that tendency, we want to add, we want to offer more, we want to, um, Give more features to to our various audiences. Yeah, more features, more touch points. Um, yeah, I mean, you can you can actually have a lot of touch points if you're a big big organization. The thing is, they get they get so complex that you're juggling all this complexity. It's difficult to keep them all aligned, right? So, you want the fewest number possible, really, and you want to emphasize those. Um, and I don't know what they would be for each of your uh, institutions that you're working for it'd be different in each case I hope but um, yeah you want you want key touch points the ones that people talk about I mean the whole thing now is um, customers have more control right so they're in control because of social media and a lot of other things that have changed in the last 15 years um, they talk to each other um, organizations are more transparent even against their will sometimes people can see into them better they know what their choices are they can Google you, you know, uh, they talk to each other on social media. Uh, so this has really shifted power to customers. Um, and it's okay. It's good if you know how to use it, right? But if you, the way to use it is to understand you're building a tribe. A tribe is a group of people in this case. A brand tribe is a group of people that uh, talk to each other and have similar interests, right? They like each other. They hang out together. So what you need to do is find your core tribe members, the people that uh, you really would like to represent your brand. Um, uh, like ideally, who would they be? And probably they would be people who are uh, admired, um, seen as intelligent, successful. Uh, they, they're um, extroverted, they talk to other people because you need them to, right? You need them to go around, tell everyone how great you are. Um, so you look for those kind of people and you work out from those people instead of uh, Segmenting your audience you start you you grow it out from the middle and once of course you've already if you're already a big institution It's kind of too late for that, but you can still shift uh, to favor Those kinds of customers those incoming students. Let's say um, by knowing who they are going out after them Understanding that they're special that maybe other institutions don't want them this particularly, but you do because you can do something with them, um, and you help them fulfill their destiny essentially. And so they go out and just tell everyone how great you are. And so that's how it works today: is you you satisfy your customers. Uh, we go beyond satisfaction. You go from satisfaction to delight, from delight to engagement, where they become part of the tribe, and then then to fulfillment. You want them to like really be everything they can be, and then tell everyone. And once you start doing that. It's pretty obvious what your touch points should be, right? I mean, you you've already figured out which ones are working. You and and you focus on those, and but they're determined. The touch points are determined by the kind of customers you want to create that you're making a space for in your world. 
I know it sounds and, kind of abstract, but uh, you know, uh, without giving examples, it's pretty difficult. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the things that that makes our institutions unique uh, would be our people and and the stories that they have and storytelling a, an essential part of the work that, that we do in higher education and we're fortunate that we have amazing stories to share in the brand flip however you urge marketers to pull back on storytelling and focus on story framing so for our viewers what is story framing uh, how, how can organizations let, do let it me well? see if I can pull up a slide here for you for everyone. okay uh, okay I think this one. No. Can are you seeing a slide of a matrix? Yes. All right. Good. All I have to do is see it myself. <laughs> uh, where did it go? We practiced this, but uh, oops. Oh, okay. What are you seeing now? Same thing. Okay. So if you're seeing it, that's all that counts. Um, yeah, it's their customers and company at the top. All right. Um, all right, so this is the matrix that I use when I work with um, organizations to, to figure out sort of a contract between the company and the customers. And this is a, a kind of a unilateral contract where you, you, you decide what you're going to provide for your customers. And if you do your job right, uh, they fit into this beautifully and they love you for it and they, they tell the world. So. Um, this is sort of the, the culmination of about 13, 14, 15 years worth of work that I've done on branding, and now I've got it down to a system. So I'm going to share this with you. So um, this is the we can call this the frame for the story. If you get these pieces right, then your customers can um, uh, are in a position to 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 get what they want from you and tell everyone else. So on so so we've got two columns customers company and at the very top you've got customer identity on the left and company purpose on the right so customer identity is their identity is who they are or actually what they want to become like it, in their wildest dreams what would they like to be how would they like to be um, so you need to really start with who are these people that you want to serve and how great are they why are they great how are they different um, how are they valuable? Those kinds of things, and I, I like to like give people a, a very difficult um, exercise of coming up with one person, the, the ide ideal. I mean, and it's of course almost impossible, but in struggling towards that, you really learn a lot about who you want to serve. Then on the other side, you've got company purpose or organizational purpose, and that's the reason you're in business or that you exist beyond making money. This is really important. In other words. Um, why are you doing this instead of something else? Why are you working here and not someplace else? What is it that really deep down uh, that you want to do for the world? And those two things, so that's why we exist. Those two things have to match up. If they don't, you've got a mismatch and you'll never really be able to, to uh, satisfy those, those customers. So um, down, down below that, you've got on the customer side, you've got what they want. This is sort of the practical um, benefits that they want from engaging with you so I want well I want a degree I want an ed, you know I want a nice place to I want a nice place to learn I want um, to meet a lot of interesting people that will uh, we, that I can help and who will help me you know the rest of my life and so forth these are sort of the practical things that they think about and uh, on the company side the organizational size it, it's your onlyness what's the one thing that we do that no one else can do better than us and everyone in the world knows it now so those two things have to match up. So the, the, the student aims, let's say, and the school onlyness have to match perfectly. Then below that, you've got um, uh, customer mores. This is the mores of the tribes that they belong to. Uh, what are the rules and the habits uh, of that tribe of people? How are they, what makes them who they are? Um, and what's special about that? How do they belong to this tribe? And then what, what are the values of our institution? Uh, what are the values we use when we hire people, uh, when we reward them and so forth? What do we believe about how the world should be? How do we behave? Those two, those two things have to match up. And when all six of these things make sense together, you've got a very simple framework for people to tell stories about you 
and you don't have to tell them. So I, I, I hear this a lot. It's, well, we, you know, it's all about our people are great and we have great stories. Well, I hear that from every school that I've talked to. They all say the same thing. So from the outside, that doesn't look different at all. That just looks like, you know, same old, same old. But, you know, you do see um, um, schools that get famous for things, and they seem to do pretty well with those groups of people. Often they undermine it by trying to do too much. But, like, uh, I think Cornell is famous for uh, ornithology. So if you like to study birds, you're going to be – that's where you're going to go if you can afford it, you know, Harvard for business or, and other things too, but Stanford for, you know, uh, taking over the, <laughs> taking over the world and possibly not even getting in. I hear since like, they had zero uh, acceptance of students this year, they didn't accept one student. So that's a very strange um, turning point in, uh, in higher education, I think. Um, so anyway, there. Um, so are you still seeing it? Yes. Okay, so do you want any questions about that before we take it off? Um, I'm checking the uh, the Twitter feed too to see if uh, viewers have questions. But again, thinking of working through that sort of process from a perspective of a, of a university, and again, going back to, to to your wealth of experience with organizations, where are those those failure points, or as you as you work through a story framing process. Mm. Uh, this framework, are there particular areas where uh, there are more hurdles or? Yes, uh, there are. Uh, yeah, people have a pretty good, usually do pretty well with uh, figuring out their uh, their purpose, organizational purpose. They have a harder time figuring out who the actual um, customers or students are, right? And they want to accept everybody, and that's a mistake. You really have to, you can take anyone, but you have to be looking for a particular kind of person, really. And uh, maybe that's what how Stanford got to this position of where well, they couldn't find anybody this year <laughs> <laughs> worth taking. You know, that, they're so particular. Uh, but I think part of that is for show. They get more donations whenever they do that. So it's a pretty messed up system. Um, the next one, uh, uh, student aims is not very hard to figure out. But the onlyness is the hardest thing for any organization to crack. They really... Mm -hmm have never had to be that disciplined about anything. So they suddenly realize, well, they don't have one. And they try to make one up that sounds like it's, yeah, this is how we're the only. But then it, from the outside, people say, no, that's not really valuable, or I don't really see that. You can say that's why you're the only, but I don't get that. So you really have to make that, you have to dramatize that thing that makes you different. And that is not, that is not, um, that doesn't come naturally to people. I think that's like dancing on your toes or something. Ballet is beautiful, but it's not natural. It's not like the something that just grows out of how you know how we walk around every day, uh, you know. And that's why it's so great. And so, the, very being very disciplined about uh, why they're special, making that specialness so visible and palpable that no one can miss it. And I appreciate in the brand flip how you equate a brand to a running narrative, that it's a story in progress where, again, the, the hero is the customer. Mm -hmm. And in, in setting the stage for, uh, for that book and talking about the 10 new realities that, that companies are facing, and I, I think it's the last one that the most successful brands are, are not static, that they're very fluid. And I think <clears throat> that's one, one of the things that, that makes our work so exciting is the yes. fluid nature of our brands. Right. And um, it's it's difficult for um, universities to sort of change their stripes uh, on the fly because um, usually things change in the real world more quickly than they do in schools. So schools are always behind, sometimes 10 years behind because they have to get uh, instructors come from the real world. So they're, they're working with slightly used information at that, at that stage. But I think that's the challenge is try to get ahead of the curve there. Um, and how do you do that? Well, by all the stuff we're talking about being different, but how should you be different? What, what is, how does this difference express itself in the actual product? In other words, the, 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 the courses and everything. And I think this is actually where I really appreciate social media. So we think of social media as a way maybe to build a brand, but I think it's a way to listen to your customers. 
because they're talking all the time in real time about what they need, what their concerns are. And if you monitor that, um, you you can kind of know where you're going to go next. You hear your um, your former students and your students telling you all the time what they need, what they're looking for, what they hope for. And so that's how you kind of stay ahead. It's, it's like having your ear to the ground. Um, so uh, rather than try to use it like in some kind of campaign way of promoting your, you know, your difference, I would just listen. I would just get in the conversation, mm -hmm. be part of the tribe, listen, be helpful, be relentlessly helpful. That's, that's a great way to think about it. It's like, how can we be relentlessly helpful? Whether we get paid for it or not, how do we just make it addictive, what we're doing? Like, you cannot ever leave our school because <laughs> you, need, you need us for your whole life. You need all the people you met. You need the instructors. You need the community uh, because it's so wonderful, right? Mm -hmm. That's what you should be doing. So yeah. it's a long-term investment. Well, our, I'm sure our students would love us if, we, uh, if we're relentlessly helpful, as would what our other stakeholder groups and uh, it has me thinking about as you as you talk through this model uh, and some of the core principles some examples of um, companies who really excel uh, in terms of embracing a flipped brand in terms of seeing greatness in their customers empowering them any examples that you would point to whether that's corporate sector or maybe even of more interest to our viewers would be outside of the corporate well, sector. You know, I um, learned about this. You guys are more into this than I am, so uh, maybe it's no surprise to you, and maybe it's not even unique. But a few years ago, uh, oh, well, by the way, I'd like to, can you, I don't know if you can see me now, or you're just seeing the slide. I can't, I can't tell. I'm seeing you right now. Okay. Um, this, you know, I think the brand flip is, you know, a, a good one to look at, but a, another one to combine with that, as you're thinking about education, would be this one that I wrote, Metaskills, a few years ago, and uh, it's all about education. So it's about, um, it, it, it's more than education, but it ends up talking a lot about education because uh, education is really necessary to um, to uh, being successful, the world being successful in the near future. I mean, we really have a lot of problems that we have to crack right now. Um, and we're being held back by um, a lot of it by the kind of schooling we grew up with, especially us older people uh, who grew up in a sort of factory uh, model of education. And so what this is saying is, look, we need skills that we don't have now that we weren't taught in school. Um, we need more than just to be able to memorize and obey. We don't need that anymore. We've got Google. What we need is to learn how to be uh, flexible, creative, to find the joy in our work so that we can learn more quickly, you know, get in the flow of what we love to do, uh, be human. We can't uh, be in, live in a world uh, full of uh, intelligent machines and compete with them. You know, we need to do something different. We need to be human. So what does that look like? And so that's the question that you're, everyone's kind of um, grappling with without actually knowing what the question is, but you see it in the national election, this is really, what this big split is all about is people wanting to go forward and other people wanting to hold back. Uh, they want to hold back because they don't know what the future looks like. It looks pretty dreary. Uh, they're afraid and they're not getting help and they, they, their education didn't help them. So uh, Metaskills is, addresses that. It's not for everyone. It's only for people who like to read um, a pretty serious book. And then I wrote this other one more for um, people that are at more action-oriented. They want to get on with it. This is drawn from meta skills, uh, and mostly it's for students. Um, and the Miami University, Miami University just bought forty five hundred copies of this to give to every incoming freshman. So they, but first they read meta skills and they went, "Ah, oh, this is what we need because the students are not going to read meta skills. We read it, but they're not going to read it." So uh, that combined with the brand flip should give you tons of ideas. Uh, meta skills has more than enough ideas, and one of the things that I one of the stories that I came across as I was writing it is going to answer your question. So a long way around the, this question, but there's a, 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 a guy from uh, Columbia, professor at Columbia, maybe he was the president of Columbia, who got frustrated with the state of education because he was uh, realized that students in these lectures were not um, asking very many questions. He wanted to get to the bottom of that. Why aren't they curious? Why aren't students curious? 
And he started to get the answers and there were three main answers. One was, uh, there's so much to learn and it's all on Google anyway. Two, uh, this is a seminar, asking questions could be a sign of weakness. That's interesting. Then three, you have to understand I'm paying for a degree, not an education. So at that point, he started a new university in uh, British Columbia called Quest. I don't know if you know this, but maybe it's a maybe it's a one of these stories that everybody knows about. But I was cheered by it when I read about it. They use the block system, so instead of a curriculum that has uh, say four subjects over sixteen weeks, they'll have one subject for four weeks in a group of people who work collaboratively with a mentor, and they do they decide to do something together. And they and they nail it for four weeks. They kill themselves on it without any distractions, no other things to work on, no juggling subjects. Uh, and so what they come out with is a deeper understanding, not only of the problem they're trying to solve, but uh, they they come out with uh, skills they wouldn't have had the skills of just sticking with something, of looking at something deeply without in interruption or uh, having to just deal with anything else. Um, and I think, you know, so there's an experiment. Maybe that's not the future of education, but it is a possible future of education. So if you're not doing these kinds of experiments around the fringes, you'll, you'll just be following the leader. And when it happens, you'll be behind the curve. So it's kind of the thing that, like, I think any large institution should be trying uh, out in little pockets, trying really radical things like this. But, of course, it has to come from, some sort of theory, right? So that's why I wrote Meta Skills. Is what what do we need people to have? And I and I think the subjects shouldn't be subjects like trigonometry or various sciences and stuff. They should be meta skills. They should be these higher order skills that let you learn anything that you want to learn. And those are the real subjects. So anything that can teach you uh, those, in this case, five. I think it's there. You need five meta skills to be innovative: feeling, seeing. Uh, dreaming, making, and autodidacticism or learning. You have those five together and you're unstoppable. And how do you learn those? Because it, those things just don't, those things aren't taught. Imagination 101 is not a class you're gonna get at you know, Illinois University. So, um, but you should, there should be that class. So things like that, when you just start looking at it in like, what are people gonna need in five or 10 years? You realize that education really needs to change. And there's your opportunity to create that uniqueness in there somewhere is your particular flavor of that uniqueness. Great. Well, I don't want to leave anything else on the table. So as we close shop here, Marty, any other really critical recommendations or, or closing thoughts that you might have for brand strategists and, and higher ed marketing professionals who are, who are in this world each and every day? Well, I, I really think there's no easy answer and everything's hard to learn, um, except if you're in, interested in it. So just you know, keep your passion going and read about all the new things happening in education, happening in branding. And um, you know, nobody knows all the answers. I certainly don't. And, and so you, you just um, uh, start to put it together in some sensible way in your own mind and then, then have these conversations with people and find, find your co-conspirators. You know, you build it out from there. You find people who think like you do, and you put something together and, and keep it moving. Get, you know, be all about action. That's what I would say. Absolutely. Well, Marty, our sincere thanks to you. It's been a real pleasure and a, a very insightful discussion. So thank you so much. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, everybody. And, See you later. and thanks also to M. Stoner, as always, for making Marketing Live possible. Be sure to get reminders about this and other episodes by subscribing to the Higher Ed Live newsletter. You can browse the archives at higheredlive.com or subscribe to the podcast via iTunes. I'm Rob Zinkin. Thanks again for tuning in to Marketing Live on the Higher Ed Live Network.